So uh, I have found a lot of times, I, I, this is something that's in my own heart, and I think it's in a lot of Christians' hearts, that when they pray, they're trying to impress the people around them. And when they pray publicly, they're trying to say things in a certain way that they're making theological points and, and that they're like sounding cool and amazing. And that's exactly what he was doing in that prayer there. He's trying to impress the people around him instead of trying to talk to God. Jesus says, when you pray, he's trying to address our heart here. It's not about what other people think. It's not about how you sound. Honestly, a lot of times it's not even about what you say. It's just that you're having a conversation with God. And so he shows us how not to pray. And he's telling us to check our heart. And now he's going to show us how to pray. He's going to give us an example of how to pray. This is an example that many of us have, have heard before, uh, that we have prayed before. And so I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to break it down a little at a time. So Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts. As we have also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So this is the Lord's Prayer. Many of us have heard this prayer before. Uh, and Jesus has shown us how to pray through it. The first thing that I'd say is going to be the most important thing. If you don't understand this about prayer, the whole rest of the basis of your prayer is going to be off. He says, Our Father in heaven. Honestly, when we're talking to God, when we're praying to God, we're talking to our Father in heaven. Okay, that's huge. Let's say that you have a kid. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. And your kid comes in and he wants a bowl of ice cream. Instead of asking you for a bowl of ice cream, he puts together a 10-piece PowerPoint. Uh, he puts together a really long speech that he writes out. He puts graphs and charts and all this on it. Are, are you going to want him to do that, to ask you for a bowl of ice cream? No. If, if my son does that, that will honestly break my heart. If he thinks that he has to do all this to approach me, to ask for a bowl of ice cream. God is saying, I'm your father in heaven. I'm a good and perfect father. So many of us are trying to win God over through our prayers. But the truth is, God has already won us over through Jesus. Through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we've already been won to God, right? Like there was a gap in between us and God, but there no longer is because of Jesus. And so when we pray, we don't have to try to win God over because he's our father in heaven who loves us, who wants a relationship with us and has a relationship with us. We were once sons of darkness, now we're sons of light. We were once sons of Satan, now we're sons of God. So we don't have to try to win God over in our prayers, right? Like we're, even to look at prayer that way is, is wrong. Uh, and this may be hard for some of you because some of you may have had bad dads. Your dad may have sucked, if, if you're honest. Your dad may have been manipulative. He may have been abusive. He may have been hurtful. And because of that, you can't view your heavenly father as a good dad. But what I would say is don't judge your heavenly father by your earthly father, but vice versa. God is good and he is loving and he, he's not manipulative. He's not trying to use you. He does want a relationship with you. He's not trying to abuse you. He is our good father in heaven and he has power to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, because he is in heaven, right? Like he, he doesn't even have to try. When we do hard things, if you think about it, when we do hard things, we kind of got to chip away at it, right? Like, like let's say I want to build a deck in my backyard. I would have to first, I've never built a deck, I'm not sure, but I think I'd have to first level out the ground, then I'd have to put some sort of post in the ground, build a foundation, then I'd have to put the top on, then I'd have to paint it and sand it, and it would take, probably for me, it'd take months. For some of you, it would take days. But it's something that we would have to chip away at. God doesn't have to chip away at, at anything. He just can do whatever he wants. He doesn't even have to snap his fingers like Thanos, like to make half the world disappear. He can do that on his own, whatever he wants. I did that for one of you out there. A lot of you, that may have went right over your head, but that's okay. God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, because he has all power and authority and control. So he's our good father in heaven. And if you don't understand that about prayer, then your whole basis of prayer will be off. I love when I hear kids pray sometimes because they haven't been indoctrinized by other Christians. And they're, just, they're literally just talking to God. The other day in tween group, we were sitting around and we were praying. And one of the kids towards the end of his prayer was like, can I just say bye? I'm like, sure. God, you don't have to say amen. He, he hears you whether you say bye or amen. And I love that. It's just you talking to your Father in heaven who loves you because you've been won over in Jesus Christ. So our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now that is a churchy word. If I've ever heard a churchy word in my life, I don't know the last time I've heard anybody use that word besides in this prayer. 
Hallowed means that praise and glory should, should all go to God, that God should get all the praise and glory in all our worship. This is going to be a hard truth to hear, but it's going to be important, and I think it's something that needs to be said. God does love you, and he does care about you, and he is for you. But before he's for you, he's for himself. His ultimate purpose is for him to receive praise, glory, and honor. And that's his ultimate purpose. He does love you, and he does care for you. He loves you way more than you even love yourself. But ultimately, this is going to sound wrong, but he loves himself more than he loves you because he's worthy of it. And so he says, Jesus says in this prayer, hallowed be your name. Praise and glory to your name. Now, this isn't something you have to do every time, but it's something that you should think about. Before you ask God for anything, thank him for who he is and for what he's done, right? You thank God for who he is. I have two sons at home, Bronson and Sterling. And they're cuter than your sons. They're adorable. Uh, but sometimes they drive me and Chastity nuts. One, some mornings, Bronson will wake up at 5.45, and he'll just be yelling and screaming, Dad, Dad, he wants out of the crib. I go in there. Uh, we, we taught him this thing. This means more for food. But instead of that, he started going like this because he's just so aggressive. So he'll wake up. He'll be like, more, more. So I'll walk in to get him food. As he's doing that, Sterling wakes up because Bronson's yelling and Sterling's yelling because he wants out of the crib. So Chastity walks in and changes his diaper. As I'm getting Bronson food, Bronson's yelling, tunes, tunes. Tunes means cartoons. He's shortening it down to cartoons. So he's saying, tunes, tunes. While I'm getting him food. So I'm like walking in, turning on the TV. Then he's yelling for food and his food's still cooking. So I'm opening up a bag of goldfish like a grenade and throwing it in at him. And it's just like, it's so aggravating because they just keep asking and asking and asking. And it's so, so annoying, more so for my wife because she's around them more than I am. She does amazing. But it's just frustrating, right, when someone is continually asking and asking and asking. God is saying here, hey, when you talk to me, or Jesus is showing us, hey, when you talk to God, it's not just about asking him for things. Before you ask him for anything, you should thank him for who he is and what he's done in your life, right? Bronson and Sterling, they're not at a point yet where they can be like, oh, thank you, Dad, for this meal you made. But we are at a point where we can thank God for what he's done in our life. So Jesus says, our Father, who's awesome and amazing in heaven, has all power and authority. We thank you for who you are and what you do. So our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've been talking about the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is God's complete rule and reign over the life of his people. Uh, we've talked about that for 12 weeks in our series on the kingdom of God. So we want God's kingdom that's in heaven to come to earth, and the way that it comes to earth is through our lives, through how we love and serve the people around us. And so we, we bring God's will from heaven to earth. We bring God's kingdom from heaven to earth through our lives. We're the conduit for that. I think the best example of this in the life of Jesus is when he's praying. He's praying in the garden. He's about to be turned over uh, to, to the Roman government to be crucified. Judas is about to turn him over. And he's in the garden and he's praying. He says, God, please take this cup out of my hand. I do not want to die. I do not want to go through this. Uh, if it's your will, please take this out of my, my hand. Now, he's not scared about dying. A lot of people think they pray that because he was scared about dying. He, he's God. He, he wasn't scared about dying. What he was scared about was taking the sins of the world upon himself. And what he didn't want to go through was being, was being punished by God, the wrath of God being poured out on him. So he says, God, take this cup away from me. I don't want to go through with this. And he's literally praying that there'd be another way for God to save his people without his life, death, and resurrection. He gets done praying. He says, amen. He looks up. As he looks up, here comes the Roman government. And here comes Judas. And I imagine in his head, he just says, well, I guess that's not the will of God. I'm going to have to do this. And so when we pray, we do the same thing. We ask God. And I don't think you need to say with every prayer, if it's your will. Like you just pray and you ask, God, can you heal this person? God, can you change this situation? God, can you save this person? You look up, and if he hasn't done it, okay, it's his will. And you keep on moving forward. So we ask God to bring his kingdom from heaven to earth through us. And we ask him to change things. And even when, we, when he doesn't, we accept it. Because ultimately, it's God's will. So our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now we might as well skip over this part of the prayer. America is so rich, we could, the end of the world could come right now and all food could be gone and Americans would still be chubby for six more months. Like we have, we have so much food and we have so much access to food that this isn't something that really hits us. What Jesus is doing here is he's asking God to meet our needs. The truth is, is that you have probably literally never gone a day without eating because you did not have access to food. You may have gone a day without eating because you've been busy or because there's stuff going on, but not because you didn't have access to food. But there were days where Jesus may not have had access to food, and so he's asking God to meet our needs. I'm not saying this is true for all Americans, but most Americans have their needs met. 
and they've never been in a position where they haven't had their needs met. If they didn't have food, they could have went to the store. If they didn't have money to go to the store, they could have went to a food bank. If they couldn't go to a food bank, they probably could have went to a friend or family members to get food. But there's literally people who do not have food and are in, in need of it. What I want to point out about this part of the prayer is what Jesus says is, give us this day our daily bread. Us. He, he's not just praying for himself. He's praying for others. So, so we may not need our needs met. Maybe, maybe we do. And maybe there are situations in here where we, need, where we have needs that need to be met. But ultimately, there's other people who have needs that need to be met, and we need to pray for them. We need to pray for the kid in Africa who's all skin and bones and has no access to food. We need to pray for the Christians in Somalia who are 1% Christian, are being killed and persecuted and being ostracized from society because they follow Jesus. We need to pray for the women in Uganda who are stuck in sex trafficking and they have no way out. And we need to pray for the people who need their needs met. So when we pray, Jesus gives us a perfect example. We don't just pray for ourselves. We pray for others, that God would meet their needs as well. I'm not saying you don't have needs. Maybe you do. I I don't know your situation. But the truth is, is that there's people who are in much more need than we are. Not that we shouldn't pray for our needs, but we need to pray for other people's needs as well. And then he says, forgive us of our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. The truth is, the moment you trust in Jesus, in that moment, Jesus has forgiven all your sins. The sins you did in your past, the sins you've done in the future, and the sins you are currently doing right now. He has 100% and totally forgiven you of all of that. And so when we ask God to forgive us our sins, the truth is, he's already forgiven us of it, right? So why do we do that? We do it because we're overwhelmed by the grace and love that God has given in our life. So we ask for forgiveness for the sins that we're committing. And that also enables us to forgive others. When we realize how much God has forgiven us, then we're able to give that forgiveness to other people. That enables us to love and forgive other people. One time I was in a youth group, and uh, this lady was talking. And she said this. uh, She said that if you had not asked Jesus for forgiveness of a specific sin in your life, then you would go to hell. Like if you sin and then you didn't ask for forgiveness for it, then you would go to hell. Uh, The truth is, your sin is so deep and so wide that you don't probably know 50% of the sins that you have committed in your heart. Like, you don't even know, like, we're talking about motives here, checking our heart. A lot of times you do the right thing for the wrong reason, and you don't even know it. The truth is, Jesus has forgiven you of your sin. If you trusted in him, not just believe, but trusted in him, he has forgiven you of every sin. And so it's not like you need to ask for forgiveness for every sin to be forgiven. That lady was, was way off when she taught that. God has forgiven you of all your sins when you trust in Jesus. You're just overwhelmed by love and grace that God has given you that you ask for forgiveness uh, anyway. So forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And the last part of the prayer is lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. One great philosopher once said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And that philosopher was Mike Tyson, right? And so we all have a plan until something bad happens. Jesus says here, Uh, that we should pray before we are tempted. Like, when we're tempted, our emotions are high, which means our judgment is low. When when you're tempted or when you're in a stressful situation, your emotion becomes high and your judgment is low. Jesus is saying, pray before you're even tempted. Now, pray while you're tempted, but pray before you're into the temptation. Ask God to keep you away from it and lead you away from it. So he asked for prayer that he wouldn't even be tempted, but God would deliver him from evil. So that's the Lord's Prayer right there. A lot of us, the Lord's Prayer, when we pray it, we we might not even know what we're saying because it's full of churchy words and it's hard to understand, but I promise you Jesus here is just having a conversation with his Father in heaven. So we've been talking about motives and how we need to have the right motives. What I'm going to have on the screen now is I'm going to have some questions. Uh, These questions are going to help you check your heart. going to see, why do I pray? Like, what is my purpose in praying? And maybe it'll help you diagnose and see, hey, maybe I have some selfish reasons for my prayers. The first one is, does your prayer change in public? So when you come and pray in front of people, do you try to sound cooler? Do you try to sound fancier? Do you try to sound more holier? If you do, then there might be something wrong with the motive in your heart. Do you feel as if you are not good enough to pray in public? If you do, then there's something wrong in your heart. You feel like you have to try to earn God's love when you don't. God's love has been earned for you already on Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Does your prayer focus more on what you have done instead of what God has done for you in Jesus? So you do more focus on on the things around you instead of how great and merciful and loving Jesus is. Next slide, please, Ethan. 
are you trying to win God over in your prayers? So like, do you feel prayer like you're coming and you're asking him and you feel like you have to try to win him over? Here's the truth. God already knows what you're thinking. He already knows what you're going to ask. You're not trying to win him over. We pray because God tells us to pray. And we ask because God tells us to ask. And we, and we, we ask him for things and he's going to do it or he's not going to do it. But you're not going to win him over by your many words and how elegant you sound. He literally says that in the beginning. Are you praying as if God is not good? So do you believe that, like, hey, God, God is, you know, he's, he's God, but he's not all the way good? Are you praying as if God is not in heaven? So do you believe that God can't fix the situations you're talking about? Do you believe that he cannot do what he says he can do, that he doesn't have all power and authority? This last slide is going to be specifically for some of us uh, as we have prayer time. Do you bring up prayer requests during prayer time? Then not pray about it yourself. So if you bring up a prayer request when we come up here and Steve comes up here, and then you don't pray about it yourself, that may show in your heart that you are not, you're not really trusting God and asking God to change anything. You just want to talk and be heard. So do, do you do that? Do you ask for a prayer request and then not pray? I don't, I don't mean not come up to the altar and pray, pray, but pray in your place, pray in your seat. That may show that your motive is wrong in it. Do you bring up a prayer request during prayer time, but then not pray about it all week? That may show you the same thing, that you just want to be heard, but not that you want, that you believe that God can fix the situation. And the last one is, do you pray for other people's requests when they bring them up during prayer time? Like you bring up your prayer requests, but then you don't listen to everybody else and, and you just pray about your own. Do, that may show your heart. So we're trying to reveal things in our heart and trying to show things in our heart. And I want to say that I've been guilty of that last slide. I've been guilty of all three of those. So if you've been guilty of them, I'm, I'm with you, all right? We all have bad motives. We all have wrong hearts and situations. So here are three things we can do to help us help God or allow God to fix our motives, to help God show us our motives and fix our motives. The first one that we need to do is we need to ask God to, I did not have time to spell check this, so that, that's pretty wrong. So I'll read it off here. <laughs> ask, usually Chastity spell checks for me, but we were really busy last night, and so I didn't have time for her to spell check. Uh, first, Ask God to show you where you are doing these things, where you have wrong motives. Ask God to show you where your motives are wrong. We were talking about the Beatitudes a couple weeks and how the Beatitudes are Christian character, but we only get Christian character by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's not like we do more, try harder, be better. A lot of things we cannot see on our own, and we need the Holy Spirit to reveal these to us. Ask Jesus, literally ask him and pray, God, show me where my motives are wrong. Show me where, where I'm doing things for the wrong reasons. These are typically things you can't see in yourself unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. So ask God to show you where your motives are wrong, specifically when it comes to prayer. The second thing is be in Christian community. When you're in Christian community, people will point these things out naturally to you. Uh, I told you guys a story last week. I'll recap it real as quick as I can. I have this friend who I grew up with in, in grade school, junior high, part of high school. So we were really good friends, and then he moved off. Uh, he, he was adopted, then he got out of adoption back into foster care. He's been kind of traveling around, and then he came back to Rant Tool like three, four months ago. And so I was talking to him, and every time I talk to him, it's just real toxic. He's really angry. Uh, he's just always upset and always like, thinks I'm like, out to get him. Well, we had a couple uh, conversation a couple weeks ago at the gym. Uh, we were talking. It was the first good conversation I'd had with him. Like, I didn't walk away angry. He didn't walk away angry. Even got to talk about Jesus a little bit. It was, it was awesome, and it was good. But a couple days later, I'm, I'm on Facebook, and he writes on my wall, Hey, Brett, you bleep, 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 and starts, like, cussing at me and saying all these crazy, crazy things about me. So I delete it. And then, like, an hour later, he posts on Facebook again. He tags me in this. He says, Brett Treferin versus so-and-so. Uh, boxing match at the gym, tomorrow morning, 8 to 9 a.m. All are welcome. I'm like, what in the world? Dead serious, he, he does this. I untagged myself, it's still out there on Facebook, it's just not on my wall, or I'm just not tagged in it anymore. So I write him, I'm like, hey, what's going on, man? Everything's okay? He's like, time for talk is over. We need to handle this, like, man, I'm, I don't even know why he's upset. He's calling me. So, okay, so I have one of my friends steps in and decides to call him to see what's going on. So my friend calls him up and is like, hey, what's the matter? He's like, Brett's just a racist, bleep, 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 all these crazy things. He says, I just want to handle this like men. I want to have a sophisticated boxing match. I want to handle this with hands. And he says all this to my friend. I'm like, what in the world is going on? I, I don't understand what I did. I don't understand why he's saying these things. I'm just really, really frustrated. So that night, 
I literally stay up almost all night. What, what I forgot to mention is I believe he has a mental health problem. Uh, I believe that he's probably schizophrenic or something like that. So I was worried that he was going to show up at my house and like try to shoot me and my family. And so I stayed up all night because I was worried about that almost all night. Finally fell asleep around three or four. Slept for a couple hours. I woke up the next morning and was talking to my wife about it. And we were having conversations uh, about it. And, and she said this. She said, Brett, what if through this, God is trying to show you that you don't trust him as, as much as you think you do? Like, because I thought that I'd have to stay up and I'd have to defend my house. And I also thought that if I showed up at the gym and had a conversation with him, that I could solve it. But she said, well, what if God is trying to show you, hey, you actually lack trust in him? I wouldn't have seen that if it wasn't on my own. But someone who was a Christian in Christian community was able to point that thing out to me. So when you get in Christian community, God is going to show you your wrong motives. God can show you what's, what's wrong in your heart. He can show you your sin. The problem is, is we need to be a Christian community as a church that's okay with talking about our problems, talking about our struggles. And we need to be okay when someone says, hey, I think there's something wrong in your heart when they approach you out of love and grace and not out of I'm better than you. When you are in Christian community, God will point these things out to you. And, and he did it last week uh, with, with my wife. And so Christian community will help show you your wrong motives. And the last thing is this. Remember that Jesus died for that. Jesus died for the wrong motives. He just didn't die for the sin that you've committed. He died for the root of that sin, the wrong motives that you had. When you literally prayed in front of people and you were praying to impress people instead of praying to impress God, he died for that. And when you didn't pray because you felt like you weren't good enough and you felt like God couldn't hear you because you weren't elegant enough in front of other Christians, he died for that. Jesus died for that sin, and, and he loves you, and he cares about you. So that's how to get over those motives. That's how to get right motives. Here's the truth. Here's what it comes down to, what Jesus is trying to show us through prayer, but I'd also suggest going back and reading about how he's talking about this when it comes to giving and fasting. The Christian life is not about us. It's about God. We need to move from thinking about everything's about me to moving to thinking everything's about God and having a dependency upon him. When you pray, it's just simply you talking to your heavenly Father who loves you. All right? So check your heart. Check your motives. Even maybe, maybe I'll post these questions to Facebook. and Go back and, and read them and see, is my heart wrong in some situations? Ask God to change you. Ask him to bring you in Christian community. And remember that Jesus died for that. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. I was worried about that almost all night. I finally fell asleep around three or four. Slept for a couple hours. I woke up the next morning and was talking to my wife about it. And we were having conversations uh, about it. And she said this. She said, Brett, what if through this, God is trying to show you that you don't trust him as, as much as you think you do? Like, because I thought that I'd have to stay up and I'd have to defend my house. And I also thought that if I showed up at the gym and had a conversation with him, that I could solve it. But she said, well, what if God is trying to show you, hey, you actually lack trust in him? I wouldn't have seen that if it wasn't on my own. But someone who was a Christian in Christian community was able to point that thing out to me. So when you get in Christian community, God is going to show you your wrong motives. God can show you what's, what's wrong in your heart. He can show you your sin. The problem is, is we need to be a Christian community as a church that's okay with talking about our problems, talking about our struggles. And we need to be okay when someone says, hey, I think there's something wrong in your heart when they approach you out of love and grace and not out of I'm better than you. When you are in Christian community, God will point these things out to you. And, and he did it last week uh, with with. My wife. And so Christian community will help show you your wrong motives. And the last thing is this. Remember that Jesus died for that. Jesus died for the wrong motives. He just didn't die for the sin that you've committed. He died for the root of that sin, the wrong motives that you had. When you literally prayed in front of people and you were praying to impress people instead of praying to impress God, he died for that. And when you didn't pray because you felt like you weren't good enough and you felt like God couldn't hear you because you weren't elegant enough in front of other Christians, he died for that. Jesus died for that sin, and, and he loves you, and he cares about you. So that's how to get over those motives. That's how to get right motives. Here's the truth. Here's what it comes down to, what Jesus is trying to show us through prayer, but I'd also suggest going back and reading about how he's talking about this when it comes to giving and fasting. The Christian life is not about us. It's about God. 
We need to move from thinking about everything's about me to moving to thinking everything's about God and having a dependency upon him. When you pray, it's just simply you talking to your heavenly father who loves you. All right? So check your heart. Check your motives. Even maybe, maybe I'll post these questions to Facebook and go back and, and read them and see, is my heart wrong in some situations? Ask God to change you. Ask him to bring you in Christian community. And remember that Jesus died for that. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.